So I just want to pray over my word this morning. I, Venice and I, Venice mentioned this to me this morning, and I think she's right, that I feel that this word is a word of um, healing this morning. Um, you'll understand why in a minute, but I believe God's wanting to just, just touch people's hearts this morning. So Father, we, we pray, I pray, Lord God, that Your Word, Your Word would go deep this morning, that Your Word would be that sharp two-edged sword that pierces our hearts and our lives with truth and with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we can't do anything. It's not my words. It's Your Word and it's Your Spirit that brings us to life. And I really pray that You would heal wounds. Uh, you would restore this morning by Your Spirit. I really believe, Lord God, and I'm, I'm expectant, Holy Spirit, that you will, you will speak to people's hearts and You will do things that have nothing to do with the words that I say, but it'll be by Your Spirit. Um, just as it happens in worship, I pray that it happens as I'm preaching the Word this morning. Father, I also pray over our giving, over our tithes and offerings. Um, Lord, I thank You. Thank You for Seacoast Church. Thank You for all the ministries that we touch around the world. Thank You for the, you know, this, this, this place of, of worship. Um, we're so grateful. So grateful, Lord God. And uh, we pray that you would help us to be good stewards in, in this precious gift that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Patrick, where are you? We haven't. We we did forget you, but we haven't forgotten you completely. We might we might have communion at the end. Is that okay? Yep. Great. I tell I tell you what. On a Sunday morning, any time, church. Oh, your kids are going out. Yes, children can go out to. Um, Children's just, uh, th- like, let's just, ex- now, now, let me talk, <laughs> explain. <laughs> it's weird, I feel weird. Um, you know, often when you're, when you're the pastor, okay, um, in church and whatever you're doing, you've got your pastor's hat on and, you, you know, you think about things. You think about what's going on, you think about what's coming next, you think about, you know, all the things that are going on in church life, and you kind of have that responsibility. Well, I'm, I, just the last couple of times, particularly we've been in worship, like on, on um, Thursday night we were here in worship, and, uh, and this morning in worship, I just, I just was, none of that mattered. <laughs> and I'll be honest, like sometimes I'm thinking, you know, like it's getting towards 20 to... Ele- uh, whatever, 11, and, um, and Ben's still, you know, off with God somewhere, and um, I'm thinking, come on, Ben, we've got to, you know, get on with the program, and, and so that's, those th- thoughts came through my head, I'm just being really honest, and, uh, and someone, I guess, you know, someone's got to do it, but um, I'm just finding that um, I'm not even thinking about those things much anymore, I think it's a good thing, I think it is. <clears throat> it's only taken me 21 years. <laughs> and forgetting communion and all that, you know, like this. Yeah, that, yeah we'll blame, blame Venice. So, it's good, isn't it? <sighs> Two weeks ago, um, we had Pentecost Sunday. And of course, I preached on the Holy Spirit. Um, but the focus was about what it means to live out of our experience of being in the upper room. And I just want to re- recalling your memory here. And, um, you know, just like when the disciples were, were baptised in the Holy Spirit in the upper room and, and the church was birthed into being. What an amazing moment. And for us, you know, the upper room, it isn't a room at all. It's, it's, a, it's a place of being, 
It's a way of life. And uh, in a way, it, it, it's a way of expressing and living out of the Holy Spirit's anointing that we carry on the inside. And, um, you know, God goes, the Holy Spirit goes wherever you are. He goes with you. You carry the upper room with you. And you are living out and you, you, you are living, a living and walking temple. That's what you are. Temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the room. You're the building. So that was a couple of weeks ago. Then last week I, I uh, spoke about Jesus. And my hope was that we would have a fresh awareness of who Jesus is and, and what his life means for us in the 21st century. It was actually about the perfect way that he loved people in a way, in a way that they needed to be loved at the time. And he knew how, how, just how to love people in a way that, that healed them, that restored them, that, that reconciled them uh, and, and, he, and drew them to the Father. Jesus, that's what Jesus did. Yes, Jesus died for us. He rose again. Um, he gave us the gift of resurrection life. But who he is, is also who we are called to be in the world. So this morning, I think it's only fitting that I now talk about the Father. You know, I kind of got it all back the front. Um, it's, it's normally, you know, when we talk about God, we talk about the Father, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But somehow I managed to, this little series kind of developed in a way that it became the Holy Spirit, the Son and the Father. And you know what, I'm sure, not, I'm sure God doesn't care. Um, they're three in one. I found uh, through my involvement in, in ministry with Christians over the years that if someone is going to struggle with, with an aspect of God's nature and his character, it will inevitably be to do with him as father. It's usually because we've, we've all had our own experience with an earthly father. And as wonderful as they might have been, none of us have had the perfect father. Just as we have all been influenced for better or for worse by our own dads, so were they um, by their own fathers and going back through the generations. So this morning is not about judgment. It's about recognising that we are part of generations of stuff and, and the fact that we all live in an, in an imperfect fallen world. For some, there's no experience of fatherhood at all. Um, fathers, for some, are completely absent. Sometimes physically, sometimes emotionally. So either way, to know and love God as your father is something that, that can take a bit of, of working through, a bit of navigating in life, especially if the, if the words uh, father uh, and abuse are used in the same sentence. I want to share a little bit this morning because I feel like God wants to each one of you and me too to kind of um, I don't know um, just he wants to touch the deep places of our heart I believe so I had a good dad not an abusive dad but certainly not a perfect one either I, I knew his father and I have been able to put the pieces together and gain some understanding of why my father sometimes responded like he did. Growing up, sometimes I felt like I was not quite the son my dad would have liked. I've seen photos. I was pretty cute. <laughs> I have to say, I, I was pretty cute. <clears throat> but I was very different in my personality to my father. He was a really good footballer um, in his younger years. He, he used to play, um, you know, in top grades for Morris Brothers in Lismore. I hate football. <laughs> hate it. I mean, I might watch the State of Origin. Some of you guys are not going to believe this, but I watched half the State of Origin. I know whoever watches half the State of Origin, but I did. The first half. 
woke up in the morning and it's like, well, okay, wished I had to watch the rest. That's really getting off the track, okay? My father loved football with a passion. I hated it. He was passionate about fishing, had his own little tinny and used to take mum fishing all the time. I hate fishing. <laughs> People have tried to get me interested in fishing. No. My father worked really hard with his hands. He started out cutting down red cedars. Um, he did all kinds of jobs. He met my mother uh, while he was delivering pumpkins to her corner store, to her parents' corner shop. He ended up being a tyre retreader and he became eventually a partner in a small business um, with tyres. But he worked really hard and heavy work right till the finish of his working life. I've always worked in an office. <laughs> I studied, I became a counsellor and, and a pastor of all things. Dad was, Dad was a disillusioned Catholic. Somewhere along the line, he decided to never step foot in a church again. I've got my thoughts about that, um, but I don't know for sure. The only way that we got him actually into this church was um, at Shannon's wedding. I don't know, if, were there any others married here? My Megan. So, we, so he, he would come to their weddings and uh, the only other time he was here was at his funeral. So the only time we got him here. His own father caused him a lot of grief because of, of his father's religious bigotry. My grandfather wouldn't go to my dad's wedding because he married an Anglican. Um, it caused, I believe it caused dad a lot of pain and grief. My mother was never accepted by my grandfather. Um, and I, I kind of have this inkling that maybe there's something there with me as well because I'm the product of their union. I still remember as a little boy finding Dad's rosary beads um, in a bathroom drawer, and in our bathroom drawer, and I, I managed to break them. Accidentally, I broke them. I feel now that there was something really significant in that happening, for Dad and perhaps for me. I look back at that moment and, and sense that something of his religious past and the generations was broken off him and off me. I just feel like the Holy Spirit revealed that to me. And I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about Catholics here. I'm talking about antichrist religious bondage, which can happen in any denomination. So I'm not, I'm not just putting Catholics down. I'm putting down religious bigotry. When Dad's friends would find out that he had a pastor as a son, especially a Pentecostal one, you know, if they knew what that meant, most of them wouldn't have had a clue, um, they, they, they would just scratch their heads in disbelief. We were so different. I had to overcome some strange feelings of rejection and become confident in my own identity in Christ. It didn't help that um, growing up too, Dad was one, the one who, who dis disciplined me as a child um, and the strap was his form of punishment. Uh, again, a generational carry down. He didn't, he didn't know any other way. He didn't know. He, he just, he didn't know how. But I, I loved him. And in his final years on earth, he, um, he had to depend on, on me and, and Venice and my sister um, so much more. And uh, he tried not to. He tried not to depend on us, but inevitably he, he had to. But I felt it brought a closeness to our relationship that was never actually there before. He truly did his best with all that he was capable of doing. And I know that, um, I know from what others have told me, he actually had a lot of respect for how I live my life and was actually really proud of me and my little family. But as I launch into my message about the Father heart of God this morning, I wanted to encourage you that Regardless of your experience with, with or even without your natural earthly father, you have a father who knew you and loved you before you were even born. 
He created you and formed you in your mother's womb. And he, he established your true identity and he had you know, all, all the days of your life written in his book. All the incredible destiny that is uniquely yours. This is how precious you are to the Father. And he is well able, if necessary, to redeem your distorted or imperfect image of what a father is. If you still have wounds from the past, he's able to heal those wounds as he reveals himself as a good, good father. Through his word, through Jesus Christ, his son, and certainly through the Holy Spirit's revelation to your life. And I know he can because he's done it with me. And now it's my desire that the church becomes a place of healing for the fatherless, for the broken, for the abandoned and for the rejected. And we have been given the Father's heart, not only for ourselves, but for others. But to know what it means to carry the Father's heart, we first of all need to know what it means to be a child of God. I, know I've, I've, I love that saying that I've said here before, it, you, you can't really become, a, a, you know, a, to become a father, you need, need to really know what it is to be a son. I'm talking to the women here too. Son is a generic term. Um, and that's who we are. We are children of our God, of God our Father. And um, this has so many implications and a few of those we'll talk about in a moment. So finally, we get to the word. Galatians 4, 4 to 8 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that, he might re- that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That is such a powerful few verses there. In, in Romans 8.15, it says a similar thing. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. The only other place Abba Father is used is when Jesus cried out to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing a torturous death. Abba is actually a term that means means father, but it is an intimate name that only a, a child uses for their own father. So to be adopted as a son into the kingdom in a kingdom sense is to really and truly become a child of our Heavenly Father. Being adopted by God means that you no long, there's no distinction between a natural child and an, and an adopted one, which of course is how most adoptive parents feel about their children, whether they're their own or their adopted ones. They become their children. I want to read that Romans 8 again but this time in the Passion Translation. It really captures the heart of God um, in in a very poetic way, as the Passion does. So again, Romans 8, 15 to 16, it says, And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God, And you will never feel orphaned, for as he he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved Father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. Maybe there are others here this morning who experienced what it feels like to have a fear of never being good enough. I I, I felt at times like I was never good enough. But that was something that was transferred, as I said, you know, from one generation down to another. I definitely saw it in my grandfather and I definitely saw it in my father. 
and it passed down to me. It is a spirit of rejection. But the Father's love breaks its power with the, full, with the spirit of full acceptance. And I'm praying that the spirit of full acceptance just washes over us this morning. I know in my life, rejection, rejection has been broken into a thousand pieces. My Heavenly Father has placed a seal of His love around me. Perhaps though there are some of, of you who still struggle with rejection. Well, that's what my message will hopefully help you overcome this morning. Not my words, but the spirit of full acceptance as it washes over us. Perhaps fear comes at you in some other form or through some other lie. You know, we, we believe, we've, as we grow up, we start to believe lies. Or some, some lie that you've received from, from your father or from someone who was meant to protect you and to care for you, to speak the truth to you. Those lies distort our concept of our Heavenly Father. And they can distort our concept of what love is. Before I go any further, I'd just like to pray right in the middle of my message here. I just want to pray right now. Dear Father, I, I pray that first of all, you would reveal to us any false understanding of who we are, that we might be, carry, what we might be carrying deep on the inside. Your truth, your, you desire truth in the inward parts of our life. And so we cry out to you this morning to shine your light, to reveal any darkness and replace it with the light of your truth. Help us break away from any form of bondage under the law, from the law, from a religious generational past, from strongholds of our own mind. Father, you know the perfect thing we need, the word, you know, a revelation, a feeling that will break the power of the enemy's lies and strongholds. And I pray, come Holy Spirit, let the spirit of adoption, that revelation of our true identity and how much we are loved and fully accepted, let that flood our souls right now. As we continue to allow your word to penetrate our hearts, let it divide and separate the pure from the vile. We want to know what, tr what true and pure love is. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, becoming a child of God means also belonging to a family. And that family is the household of God. It's Christ's body, the church. And we, you know, we, we all have the same father. We are literally brothers and sisters with Christ. Isn't that amazing? Aren't you glad? I've only got um, one natural sister, but I've got heaps of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I won't read it again. I've read this many times recently. But John 17, I love John 17. It reinforces the heart of Jesus, that we would become one with him and one with the Father. And all that Jesus um, has with the Father, that place of, of glory um, that he talks about, we have it too. We are one with them. We are one together. And it's mind-boggling to try and comprehend, but it's true. And I picked up on a, something we were singing there. It said, in the, in, in, the midst of the mid, in the middle of the mystery or something. Is that the word? In the middle of the mystery. I feel like we're in the middle of the mystery. We've, we've, some things have become a revelation to us. Some things we have unfolded and we think, oh, yes, that's, that's what that means. You know, that's, this is where we're at. But there's kind of half the mystery still to come. And I feel like we're in the middle of the mystery. And it's, it's, and it's, it's an exciting place to be. Um, and and I, that's how I feel about where we're at as a church. Um, if we knew all the mystery, how boring would that be? You know, we've got lots to discover, lots to unfold, lots to be excited about, and lots, lots to be expectant about. That's the word, I reckon, for the month. Be expectant. Be expectant. I don't know why I even said that, but anyway... It's, you know, understanding the mystery of what it means for us to be one with Father and one with the Son. Wow. And going alongside that is this whole revelation about being an heir of God, an heir of God through Christ. As blood-washed 
spirit-filled, you know, born again, sons and daughters of God, we have inherited something incredible. We, we no longer have our, our own brokenness and curses and vulnerabilities of the past. That's no longer our inheritance. Luke 12, 32 says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Wow, the kingdom. What more is there? And this is so much more than a natural inheritance. This is so much more than a transaction or a, you know, like a transfer of an estate. Firstly, he says, do not fear, little flock. He's speaking to us as a, protect, as a protective shepherd, overseeing and caring for the sheep, an analogy that Jesus uses often. And it's, it's the Father's good pleasure, it says. So it is our Father's delight, it's his, his joy, His pleasure to give us His kingdom. He's not, he's not wanting to hold it back. He's wanting to release it with joy, with joy. You know, some people come to God, particularly when they've had experiences with their own father, and they think there's got to be an, ul- uh, there's got to be an ulterior, ulterior motive. There's got to be something that he's holding back. There's got to be some other, you know, can he really be trusted? He can be totally trusted. And he doesn't want to hold anything back. And his word is true. He wants to release his kingdom to us with joy. Oh. Yeah, come on. And he says, when the fullness of the kingdom comes, okay, this is when we're in glory. It says in Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So we have the kingdom now but there is going to be the fullness of the kingdom released upon us in glory. So you see, God has always had it in his heart to bless his children with his kingdom. And then he gives the reasons why, following straight on, why we are given this precious inheritance. Listen to this. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Jesus then says, when you did it for the least, you did it for me. This is heart stuff. This is deep heart stuff. It's about getting our heart right and our heart aligned with God the Father. This is the Father's heart. This is what his children do. This is why I'm going. I mean, I'm going. I'm going I'll keep on going. He is the father. He's the father. We're the children. He provides everything in his whole kingdom. But our part is to express the father's heart and love to those who need it, which is everyone. And although in this instance. Jesus is referring to the fullness of the kingdom being released in heaven. We also know that the kingdom of God is for now. And the most incredible thing is that the kingdom is, it's not over there. It's not over here. The kingdom of God is within us. We carry the kingdom of God as our inheritance on the inside. I don't know how everything fits in here, to be honest. We have Christ in here. We have the Holy Spirit's anointing in here. We have the fullness of God in here. And now we have the kingdom. All in here. I don't know. That's a mystery. Our Father has placed it here so that we can become His true, authentic, anointed children. It's the Father's gift to simply, to simply be received to be accepted because it says in Luke 18, 17, assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So he gives the kingdom with joy, with delight 
And that's how he expects that we should receive it with childlike joy and delight. It's not complicated. Aren't you glad that, that your effectiveness and your impact in ministry isn't dependent upon your own goodness and power? Oh, man. It's dependent purely on God's kingdom goodness and power that He, as a loving Father, has given you as an inheritance. We've got this amazing down payment here on earth, and it's a big down payment. It's not just like 5%. It's a big, big down payment. More than enough, way more than enough. And the rest is, is to come later. <clears throat> okay. Okay. When preachers normally speak about the Father Heart of God, they inevitably end up somewhere talking about the prodigal son. And when I started out my messages, I was determined. I'm not going to talk about the prodigal son because everybody talks about the prodigal son when they talk about the father. But how can you leave the prodigal son out? That's because it's a beautiful picture of, of Father God's heart towards us. And I'm not going to read the scriptures. I'm just really quickly going to remind you of the story. The prodigal son wanted to live his own life. He wanted to live it his own way. He wanted his inheritance early. He wanted to go and blow it. He really didn't know what he, I don't know what he really wanted, but that's what ended up happening. He blew the inheritance. He ended up living in a pigsty with the pigsty? Yeah, in, with the pigs. And when he came to his senses, he realised that he had left what he had left in the first place. He returned home with his tail between his legs, his little piggy tail between his legs. All the while, the father was watching and waiting. All the while, the father's looking. The whole time, the father is looking. That's, if anything in that story speaks to me, it's that. Parents, don't stop looking. Fathers, don't stop looking. Keep looking. The other son who stayed, stayed home faithfully by his father's side throughout the whole time, being the good boy that he was, he ended up getting an attitude. Poor me. You know, he had this little pity party going on. The thing is, a true father's love and acceptance is always there to be found again. A father never rejects a son or a daughter who genuinely turns their heart back towards him. Never. In the same context of the, as of the prodigal son, Jesus talks about the sheep that was lost, but now is found. He speaks about the, the coin that was lost, but now is found. And here he talks about the son that was dead and who has come to life again. He was lost and now he's found. That's our Heavenly Father's heart. Always ready to... to <coughs> excuse me always ready to reconcile, <clears throat> to restore, to rejoice, to embrace his children as they turn their hearts towards him. Thanks. So just as we come in for a landing, you guys can come up if you want. 1 John 3.1. This is just the first part of 1 John 3.1. In the Passion Translation, it says, Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvellous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us his very own beloved children. You know, in the New Testament, it's so easy to find verses that, that paint this amazing picture of our Father in heaven. That's because in the New Testament, we have Jesus, God's own Son. And when we see Jesus and know him, then we also know the Father. In Hebrews 1.3, it says, The Son is the dazzling radiance of God's splendour and the exact expression of God's true nature. His mirror image, he holds, he holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins and then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the Majestic One. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. 
perhaps our prayer should also be this morning that our lives would be a true representation also of the Father's heart. That Jesus would be seen by the world through us and therefore they would also see the Father. Wouldn't that be just the most amazing thing that as we live our life out, just normal daily life, that people actually would see the Son, but they'd also see the Father. It's a high calling, but there is, there is no fear. There's no fear in this calling. And if we come as little children, He has promised us that the kingdom, the kingdom is our inheritance. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, our Father in heaven, how incredibly amazing and beautiful and wondrous you are. And you have us in in this place, in the middle of the mystery. And every time something is revealed, we're just overwhelmed. And Lord, we trust you. We trust you, Father, that, that you have all things in hand, that you see the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And even though we don't see the rest of the mystery right now, we trust that it's there and that you will reveal it in your good time. And I pray that each one of us this morning, as your word has gone forth and as your Holy Spirit has been hovering over us and even penetrating our own hearts, that there's been a healing, there's been a restoring, that we are no longer bound to whatever ever our experience was of our earthly father, whether it was good or it was bad, but our true father, the first father that we've ever had is you. And you have loved us from the beginning of time You have loved us even before we were in our mother's womb, but certainly in our mother's womb, you you created us. You you gave us our personality. You gave us the, the things that pertain to our life. Your presence was there the moment of conception. So Lord, we... We just humble ourselves before you, your children. We come as children this morning. We receive your kingdom as an inheritance because Lord, your word is true. and says that you give your kingdom with joy, with gladness of heart, with such a desire that we would walk in it and receive it and fulfil it. This is our heart's desire to this morning, Lord God, that we would be fully children of God, truly walking as kingdom people, sons and daughters, knowing who we are, knowing that our our true identity is solid, it's, it's firm, it's secure, but also is our destiny. Our destiny is secure in You. As we worship You, even now, Lord, as we enter this place of worship again, I really pray that You would continue to heal and restore and, and release upon us your kingdom, our inheritance, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship. Oh, before we do that, sorry.
Patrick. What a patient man. He didn't have much choice, did he? But I thought I was getting the flick there for a minute. <laughs> You're not going to be so lucky, though. Um, <clears throat> Pastor Jim already taken a lot of the words I was going to say. So here we go. So when I was asked to do the communion, the first thing that came to me was, praise the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Praise the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness. His faithfulness to the sky. And, and the whole sermon was about that. And, you know, <clears throat> yesterday I was cycling. I'm doing something that is not as dangerous as Val, which is bowling. But I was doing cycling. And uh, when I go cycling on the plateau, I'm, I'm doing it with God, with the Lord. And we, uh, we circle and uh, I look at this. Oh, Lord, isn't that beautiful? Look at this valley. Look at those trees and I marvel at the, the different shades of green, the different shapes. And I say, Lord, you did all that for us. You did that for us. When I'm at work and, and I've got a problem, I said, Lord, what do I do about that? And... Within a few minutes, I've got the solution because God gave it to me. So what I'm saying is that God is not some religiosity somewhere out there. He's to be worshipped and revered and honored, honored and, and given all the glory and the power and praise that is due His name, but He's with us every moment of the day. When we walk, when we sleep, when we, when we have fun, when we're sad, God is with us because He is a part of us and we are a part of Him. We are one with Him, He is one with us. Like Jesus said, on the, I, I am the vine and the Father and I are one. And because of Jesus, we are one with the Father. Isn't that good? You know, and God, even if you, and you might think, oh, well, um, it's okay for you because you belong to the Christian faith, but I'm not. But tell you what, God can heal you. Even if you don't know Him right now, God can heal you because that's what He did with me. I remember the time I said to Lord, I don't know if you really exist, but if you do, reveal yourself to me. Now, if you say that from your heart, I'll let, you, I'll, I'll let you know that God will answer your questions and He will be upon you. It took me six months to give my heart to Jesus. But for six months, God gave the most incredible answers to my prayers because He knew my heart. So what God wants from His children or these children to be, say, give me your heart. Give me your heart because it's a, we talk about the prodigal son. But that's what God is there. He's just looking for us. Whatever stage we are, I say, come on, come with me. And he's got his beautiful, loving arm. And he's, that's the only thing he wants to do too. Be with me, my child. Be with me. And you know how could we can do that? It's because of Jesus. God gave his only son. He gave him to us so we could have relationship with Him and with Jesus. Forgiveness of sin, eternal life, love ever ending. I can't wait to be to heaven. I mean, I'm okay now. I'm happy here. But I know it's going to be like a million times better. All the beauty that surrounds me when I go cycling, all that beauty, it's going to be, it's just the beginning. It's just a little seed because it's going to be marvelous over there. All this because of the love of God to us that gave His one and only begotten Son to us. And whoever acknowledges Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior shall be saved. That's what the Father said. And we have the Holy Spirit in, in us to help us every day of our lives. So as we're going to take the bread and 
the wine slash juice. We're going to be so grateful in our house because there's nothing better than a grateful heart. And Lord, we love you with all our heart, with all the fibers of our body, Lord. We love you and we bow before you and we thank you, Abba, Dad, my heavenly dad, our heavenly dad. We thank you that your love is so immense and so deep and so jealous and so intense. We thank you, Lord. And Jesus, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done, for your sacrifice on the cross, for your body that was broken for us, for your blood that was shed for us and for so many. So Lord, now as we take the bread and the wine, it's with an incredibly, incredibly grateful heart that we come before you and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.